Hey, welcome to Discovery Church. How many excited to be in God's house today? Amen? Awesome. So glad you're here. We're in this last installment, part four of a series called Anxious for Nothing. And if you missed any of these, please go check them out online because I hope that, that I hope you're getting a vision of your future without this limiting anxiety in your life. And this honestly is probably the, the issue of our culture right now, of our society, of our of our youth, young adults, adults, of everybody. Like, I was reading some statistics recently. 21% of us are suffering from anxiety. Like, right now, we're suffering from it. And it always is alternating. And the, the crazy thing is that stat I was reading was 93. They said 93.5 of us aren't telling anybody about it. So we're, like, suffering kind of in, in silence. So um, hopefully I'm giving you a a picture, a reality, that you don't have to live this way. You actually can be free in Jesus' name. Amen, somebody? So here's our key verse that we've been sharing every single week, and I'm hoping that this is getting in your spirit by now. Amen, you guys, that you're, you're getting the hope and the promise of this verse. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7. One more time, you guys, do not be anxious about anything. Like, that's possible, you guys. You can do this with God's help. This can be a reality. You can be anxious for nothing, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which every one of us want, we all need, that peace that transcends all understanding. Like, I don't even know how I'm getting by, but I'm like at peace right now. That kind of peace will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Last week, we studied 1 Kings 19, the, the, a season of Elijah's life, where it got really hard for him. He actually had all four of the primary reasons why we suffer from or with anxiety. We've been talking about those four reasons, but they all showed up at one time in Elijah. He felt uncertain. He felt unsafe. He was a little unhealthy. We talked about how your health can actually affect your anxiety. And he was unaccompanied all alone. And, and that's where we're going to talk about today. The title of today's message is The Dangers of Isolation. The Dangers of isolation. Let me be very clear up front with you guys. I'm, I'm going to attempt to convince you of this reality today. Like it's, it's dangerous to be all alone and to be isolated. And for those of you that do know this, I hope that the Holy Spirit will compel you toward the, the right community you need to walk out freedom and healing. Amen, somebody? Like this is, the, isolation is dangerous. Uh, when a prisoner, think about this, consider this, when a prisoner violates the rules of the prison, they're thrown into what? Isolation, solitude, the hole, they call it. After a judge and a jury take away all the freedoms of a citizen and a human being and, and they, they strip their freedom away and put them in a cell, there's still one more thing that they can do to punish them. Make them alone, completely alone, all alone. Remove them from every person, every other inmate, and keep them Alone, researchers, a lot of them say this is, a, this is like a form of punishment, and now it's all of us. We're choosing this. We're doing this to ourselves, choosing to be isolated. Well, let me take you back to the very beginning of creation, the very beginning of your Bible. Remember, in the very beginning, it was God who created everything, right? In the beginning, God created everything. He said it was good. He created the light, said it was good, he created day and night, land and water, he said it was good. He created the birds and the animals and the stars and the plants. All of it was good. Then God said, something's not good, right? He, after creating man with no one to celebrate with, no one to cry with and laugh with and share their life with, he looked at man in Genesis chapter 2, 18. The Lord God said, looked at man and said, it is not good. It's not good that man's alone. And this is not a marriage verse. This is a verse about relationship and community. For anyone in here that has said, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I don't need them. I don't need people. I don't need friends. I don't need a group. I'm good. I Just me and God. Just me and God. That, that's all I need. Apparently, Adam had a really intimate relationship with God. Better than every single one of us would have. We, we, you might have a relationship with God, but Adam walked with God in the Garden of Eden. In the cool of the day, it says, so apparently Adam had a really good intimate relationship with God, and yet, listen to me, it was not enough. Some of y'all think that's sacrilegious what I said right now, but I didn't say it. God did. God said it. God looked at him, a man created in his image who had an intimate relationship with, and he said, it's not enough. It's not good. 
because I created you to need more. You were created for community, and yet we're choosing isolation. And we're, we can see this all throughout the Bible, and this isn't just biblically. All throughout the Bible, we see that we were created for this, that we need community, we need each other, that God looks at his creation and says, this ain't good that you're all alone. Like, this is a biblical concept, but even beyond that, this is like also neuroscience and cognitive psychology and honestly just common sense. This is just common sense. Let me explain to you how not good this is if today you find yourself alone or lonely. How not good this is and how it's actually affecting your anxiety. Our brains, did you know, are constantly scanning our environments for threats. Whether you're aware of it or not, you're conscious of this or not, your brain is, is constantly scanning for people, situations, and things that are a threat to you, that can take you out. And when you're lonely, here's what happens. Your body ramps up threat detection. It, when you're lonely and you're alone, your body raises the baseline level of, of, of your threat detection because it knows this one critical fact, you're all alone out here. You're alone. Like you can't rely on your tribe to spot danger. And if you have to, you got no one else. If you're gathering food or fire, you got no one keeping watch. You got no one watching your back. You're out here on your own and your body knows it. Your mind knows it. You're created for community. It's not good. Not only that, but when your brain identifies you're alone, here's what's happening. And this is by design. God made you this way. When you, when you identify you're alone, your brain dumps cortisol and adrenaline into your bloodstream. Adrenaline, like pun, like and basically this is the fire alarm. The fire alarm will start happening like this is a, hey, there's a problem here. You alone, you're alone. Emergency, crisis, no one's got your back. Solve this, solve this right now, okay? So, so when, when, here's something else too. When your brain recognizes you're alone, what we actually do is we divide up the world in us versus them. That's what we do when you're, when you're isolated, when you're alone. You, you divide up the world of who's safe, and who's not, and you over-identify people and situations as threatening because when you're solving for survival, it's better to, be, to assume and be wrong than to not assume and be dead. So, so being lonely, listen, it makes us feel and see threats that aren't really there, which is why when you're lonely and isolated, you're easily triggered, suspicious, and you hurt people around you. I, a lot of psalms, I wanna, there's a psalm I want to read to you, but a lot of psalms have these headers um, that the writers of the psalm would put inside of the, uh, inside of the scripture right before to give context to when that song was written or when that psalm was written. I want to study a psalm with you today. It's a psalm of David, Psalm 142. The header that David gives this, check this out. It says this in your Bibles. The header is a psalm of David when he was in a cave, a prayer. So Psalm 142 actually comes from a time of, of David's life when King Saul tried to kill him, threw a spear at him, tried to kill him a couple times, and he has to run away. And he runs to a literal dark cave, and he's all alone. He's in a place where he thought that people were his friends, his companions, people that were supposed to protect him, they turned their back on him. They were supposed to be there for him, and he found out they actually aren't for me. And he's alone, and he's in a cave. And it's hard. He's in a dark place. And he writes about it. Psalm 142, starting at verse 1. It's just seven verses. Let's read it together. Psalm 142, verse 1. I cry aloud to the Lord, he says from this cave. I lift up my voice to the Lord for mercy. I pour out, my, I pour out before him my complaint. Not Instagram. Come on, somebody. I pour out before him my complaint. Before him I tell my trouble. When my spirit grows faint within me, it is you who watch over my way. In the path where I walk, people have hidden a snare for me. I thought they were for me, but they're actually trying to trap me. Verse 4. Look and see. There is no one at my right hand. Some of you, you came in today and you're alone. Like if you look, look around, you're like, I don't know where they are. Where'd they go? I feel alone. There's no one. No one, he says, concerned for me. I, got, I have no refuge. No one cares for my life. Does anyone even care about what I'm going through? I don't, I don't see them. They're not, they're not here in this cave with me. I cry to you then, Lord. I say, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Listen to my cry, for I'm desperate in need. Rescue me from those who pursue me, for they are too strong for me. Set me free from my prison, he says. And that's what it feels like 
If you're in a cave today, if you're alone, if you're isolated, it feels like a prison, like you're confined. And I'm not supposed to be here. This isn't right. It doesn't feel right. It set me free from this prison so that I may praise your name. Now check this out. Then, here's what he says. Because I'm praising your name in the middle of this situation, then the righteous will gather about me because your goodness to me. Here's what David is saying. Your response to your loneliness will attract the next people who show up in your life. So in your, if your loneliness turns to isolation and you're in, if you get in an alone season and you get stuck there and isolate yourself and you're negative and you're critical and you're stewing and it's us versus them, I promise you, you will attract negative stewing people into your life. But because David cries out to God and makes him his refuge, here's what happens. You go read about this biblical account in 1 Samuel chapter 22. That's where he runs from King Saul, goes to this cave. But in his cave of loneliness, he doesn't let it turn into isolation. He cries out to God. God, help me. I need you. They weren't for me, but you are. God, I'm going to praise your name. And because of that, God brought the right people to him. He brought a band of brothers to him in the middle of his cave. And not only that, he reconciled with his family and his brothers while he was in this season that began of aloneness. So my question today is, what do you do when you're lonely? What what do you you do when you're you're alone? Do Do you allow your aloneness to turn into isolation? How do you respond and react to those seasons in your life where you find yourself, and every one of us will find ourselves eventually alone? in different stages and seasons of our life. You know, the researchers say when you're lonely for extended periods of time, if you you let your loneliness turn into isolation, it like increases some risk factors. Let Let me just go over some risk factors of being lonely. Heart attacks. You know you're more susceptible to heart attacks when you're alone? When you're lonely, isolated. Cardiovascular disease, cancer, addiction, Alzheimer's, and depression. When you're isolated, you're more likely to get depression and personality disorders and suicidal ideation. And yelling at the TV for the offensive coordinator to run the ball more. Was that one just me? I'm, just, I'm like alone. Like, Come on, are you kidding me? A pass again? Anyway, anyway. For a lot of us, it's terrifying to connect. It's like it's a terrifying thing. It's like it's like an exposing thing. But it doesn't change the reality that loneliness. Listen to me. When you choose, if you're choosing isolation today. As not good as it, and you know it's not good, you're choosing that over connection. Listen to me, let it sink in. You're choosing a sick life. You're choosing to be sick. You're choosing to be ill. You're choosing to die early. You're choosing to hurt the people around you. Look, it, it, we, we got to make some different choices here. We, we got to choose to invite people into your life, knee to knee and shoulder to shoulder. You have to choose openness. You have to choose awkwardness sometimes. You got to choose not to live a life of isolation. You got to choose connection, church. So what do we do? What do we do in, that, in those times where we do find ourselves alone? All alone, maybe in a cave. What do you do when you're lonely? Write these down. Number one, you confess your loneliness. This is what David did. You confess the loneliness. You cry out to God. You go, yes, I, I realize this is not good. If you don't want your loneliness turning into isolation, you confess it. And now I say confess. I'm not saying it's a sin or anything. You just tell God the reality of what you're feeling. This is the reality. I'm alone, and it's not good. It's not that it's a sin. There's nothing wrong. Every one of us will have to be alone at some point in our life. But how do you respond to it? How do you react to that season? Consider those people in the Bible who knew and loved the Lord, were very faithful, who found themselves alone at times. King David wrote about it often. Here's another, Psalm 25. He said, turn to me and be gracious to me, for I'm lonely and afflicted. The troubles of my heart, look what he says, they're enlarged. Okay, I got some troubles, but because I'm isolated and I'm alone, the troubles are actually enlarged in my heart. I make them bigger. They weigh more. They, they're heavier on my heart because I'm Carrying it alone, it's harder for me to sleep at night. It's harder for me to concentrate. It's just harder for me to deal with everything because I'm alone and it's enlarged in my heart, David says. Paul is another person. He says, at first defense, no one supported me. Like no one thought I could do it. No one thought, they weren't really for me in this. I had to step out all alone. All deserted me, he said. Even Jesus in Matthew 26, Jesus on the night he was betrayed, 
On the night he would be killed, he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray, but he doesn't want to go alone. He takes his three closest friends, his three closest disciples, Peter, James, and John. And he says, can you, can you come pray with me? And they don't even stay up. They didn't even, Jesus tells them, you couldn't keep watch from me for one hour? On Jesus' worst day, he needed people around him. Jesus did. He didn't want to go alone. And he, listen to this, Jesus wouldn't, Jesus wouldn't let himself be enough. Let that sink in. Jesus would not let himself be enough. He was like, what I'm about to go to, I need some, I need you guys with me. And I know you're going to fall asleep and you guys suck sometimes, but I need you anyway. Will you just come with me? And like, I just need you close because this is hard and just be right here. Just be here with me in this because this is hard. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, 12 says, though one may be overpowered, one. And that's what some of you feel like right now. You're alone, you're one, and you're getting overpowered. You're getting overpowered by your temptations. You're getting overpowered by your anger. You're getting overpowered by the things that are triggering you. You're you're getting overpowered because you're alone. But, but, two can defend themselves. And a cord of three strands is not quickly broken. You get the right people around you, you won't be breaking down and giving in anymore. It's not broken when you get the right people around you. I think there are a few reasons why we choose isolation, though. Even though we know it's not good and it's dangerous to be alone and your body's telling you, your brain's telling you, and you're kind of convincing yourself otherwise, I think there are some reasons why we're choosing isolation. Let me kind of go over a few of them with you. Some of them might be able to connect with you, okay? Number one is naivety. Write that down. We're just naive. Some of you, some of you probably even said, I don't need people. I don't need them. I don't, I don't need people. You know? Like God, God, I'm built different. You really think God made you different than every other human? When he said it's not good, like it's not good for you. No, no, no. So we're naive to think, I'm, I, don't, I don't need it. Or maybe you're caught up in, the, in this false reality that just because you're connecting online that you're actually connecting. I mean, you know, communication is not connection. Okay? I could text my wife all day, I love you. But all she's getting is a data signal. She's missing out on my warmth, on my presence, on my vocal tone, on, on my, on, on my uh, uh, everything, man, on my presence, on, on my embrace, on my energy, on my actions, on my picking up my own underwear. She needs my presence in her life. That's how she knows she's loved, right? But some of us are naive. We're naive. Ah, I don't need people, right? Some of us are choosing isolation. Here's another reason, because of our temperament. Our temperament, like our personality. I'm just not a people person, which would be most of you in the room right now in our culture today. I'm just not a people. Jason, you're a people person, man. I'm just not like that. It's uncomfortable for me. Can I give you some advice if that's you? You're not a people person. You're allowing that to keep you isolated from connection. Can I give you some advice? Get over it. Get over it. I know it's awkward. I know it's uncomfortable, but you need this. If you want an anxious for nothing kind of life, you need this. Let me show you verse, Proverbs chapter 18, verse 1, in the New Living Translation says this, unfriendly people care only about themselves. They lash out at common sense. What common sense? The common sense we're talking about here. How God made you. You ain't good by yourself. How neuroscience, psychology, your brain works, all of it. You're like lashing out. You're choosing something that ain't good. It's not, it's, you're not using common sense. Here's how the New King James Version says it. A man who isolates himself seeks his own desire. Could it be that your temperament, your I don't need people, is just an excuse for you to seek your own desire? He rages against all wise judgment. You know, Scripture here makes the correlation between isolation and unfriendliness. It's like you can't have one without ultimately becoming the other. Like if you remain isolated for an extended period of time, listen to me, you will become unfriendly. If you remain isolated for an extended period of time, you will become a selfish person, someone who seeks your own desire, okay? So this is, why are some of us choosing it? Because, you know, we just think we're not built that way. We've convinced ourselves, our temperament, I don't need people. How about this? Some of us are choosing isolation because of fear. We let fear hold us back. We've talked about this a little bit in the series already, so I won't belabor this too much, but we have these fears like, oh, what if they... What if they, they, I don't even know how to talk in front of people. What if they think I'm dumb? What if they think I'm an idiot? What if, what if, what if? And all these what ifs are keeping us from what's God, what God's best for us. Or write this down. We're choosing isolation, a lot of us, because of our past experiences. 
our past experiences. Like it didn't, it didn't work last time. I tried this last time. I tried some friends, tried to connect. I tried the group. Something happened in the past, and it just burns you. And because that's burned you, you've basically come to the conclusion that you can't be involved anymore. You can't be connected anymore. And you need to understand something about this, you guys, because the enemy, his plan in your life, like he's a schemer, and he was working at not just you. And that anytime you got hurt, that relationship, that past experience that hurts you, he was actually scheming a lot bigger than just that relationship. He wanted to, listen to me, he wanted to affect you so much that you wouldn't trust or get into another relationship again. He wants you to not, ever, not get the power you need from people that you were designed for. He wants you operating outside of your design. He wants you in a place where you're not good. So we make these issues the issue. And you need to let God heal you from some of that stuff. But these past experiences are keeping us isolated. Or here's this last one, busyness. For a lot of us, we just, you know, I don't have time. I'm just, I'm just too busy. And I know that's not you because you came to church today. You're not, you know, it's not you. You're not isolated because you came to church, Right? Come on, how many of you know just because you're in the building doesn't mean you're in community? Those are two totally different things. Two absolutely different things. You could be in the building and still be isolated. So what do you do when you're lonely? When you find yourself in a cave and alone, you got no one to count on. Stop isolating yourself there and cry out to God. Like, like confess your loneliness to God. And number two, take advantage of your loneliness Take advantage of it. See, sometimes there are circumstances you can't control. You will lose relationships. You, you're going to become alone at times, whether you have to move cities, change your jobs, change your careers, a relationship dissolves. Sometimes it's not even to the enemy's work and, and division and strife. Sometimes it's just a natural course of a friendship. They just kind of, you just kind of outgrew each other. They got married and you did it. They started having kids and you did it. They started making some different choices that are unhealthy. You said, I ain't going there. So sometimes relationships just naturally drift. And you might find yourself in a stage or a season where you're alone. And that loneliness, listen to me, will either drive you to destructive habits or to drive you to the presence of God. How do we, how do we respond here? If you don't turn to the Lord, you may, you may try to deaden your feelings with other things like alcohol and drugs. You might try to get temporary relief from sexual affairs or working more hours. I don't got them in my life anymore. I don't got them. I can just work more. You just, let me just kind of excessively work. When I say take advantage of your loneliness, I'm referring to you being with yourself and Jesus, like connecting authentically and intimately with him so that you are able to connect authentically and intimately with others. Let me show you how Jesus modeled this in Mark chapter 1, 35. It says, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house he was in with all of his disciples, and went off to a solitary place by himself where he prayed. Simon and his companions, the other disciples, they woke up, no Jesus, where'd he go? They went out looking for him. And when they found him, it says, they exclaimed, Every, Jesus, where'd you go? Everyone's looking for you. Apparently, Jesus was hiding from his disciples. How many of you parents in this room have a hiding place from your kids or have ever had a hiding place from your kids when they were toddlers or something? Anyone? A lot of liars up in here. Just get, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, you parent long enough or they get to a stage, I promise you, you will circle that block when you're coming home. You're like, I don't want to go in yet. Or you'll pull into the driveway and you're like, I just need to finish this song right now before I go in. I want you to notice that even Jesus needed to spend time with Jesus. And if you never spend any time disconnected from the external things, those external things will, will drive every expectation in your life. Jesus withdrew to the sol a solitary place. He was alone. In fact, some of your translations say lonely place or wilderness, some translations say. He had a hiding place where he'd get away. But he, he didn't have a place where he got away to check his emails, get away to check, you know, organize his life and do his tasks. No, he went away. And he prayed to his father. He got his, he got his inner life aligned with his purpose. God, what do you have for me? What am I to do? What, what, what am I to set? Look what it says in verse 38. Peter comes in like, everyone's looking for you, man. What are we, what are we doing? Where are we going? And Jesus replied, let us go somewhere else to the nearby village so I can preach there also. This is why I have come. I'm not going to let your demands and you guys look, I'm not going to let you dictate what 
God has for my life. I've already spent time. I've spent time with my father, and I know where I'm going. I know what I'm doing. Here's what we're going to do. But if you don't have this place in your life, you're going to spend your life scrolling through screenshots of everybody else's version of a purpose, and you're going to be an imitator of somebody else's purpose, not God's purpose for your life. Jesus understood how important it was to get alone sometimes. So, so what do you do when you're alone? You take advantage. You don't let that loneliness drive you to isolation. You let the loneliness drive you to the presence of God. What is my purpose? What do you have for me, God? This is what, this is what David does. And then the third thing is this. Develop godly friendships. Develop godly. The goal isn't just to acquire friends and people to spend time with. You got to be discerning in your choice of your companions. You get the wrong friends in your life. They can drift you off into sin and further isolation. You get the right friends in your life, man, they're going to encourage you in God, especially in times of isolation and loneliness to pursue God. I want you to be bold. I want you to be as bold in your friendships as you are with the restaurants you choose. I mean, like, what's he talking about with restaurants and stuff? How many of you ever got food poisoning out, getting out, going out to eat anywhere? Anyone ever got food poisoning? How many of you ever had bad service? Anyone had bad service before? Any of that stuff happened to you and you go, after your time at that restaurant, did you go, I am never going out to a restaurant again in my life. <laughs> Done. Done with restaurants. No, even if you said that, a few days later, you got hungry. <laughs> I mean, you didn't want to cook. You're like, hmm. You guys want to go out to eat? Let's go out to eat. And you go out, you go get another. You might not go to that same one, but you go to a restaurant, right? See, some of you have given up on friendship and choosing connection because of some bad experiences with friends. But listen to me, your spirit needs connection like your body needs food. I want you to be as bold in friendship and choosing, getting some godly friends around you as you are with, with the restaurants. And your experience is great. You don't let them stop you from eating, finding a new, a new spot. How I many of you know you get the right attitude, God will bring the right friends to you. You got to develop godly relationships. Let, let's go back to this book of Acts here, the very beginning of the early church and see how they did it. It says every day they continue to meet together. Every day. Every day? Yeah, every day. The Bible says every day. Man, I got a social battery for that. Are you serious? Every day. They would meet together in the temple courts, and they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. Every day, they would meet together. And this was more than just like physical proximity. This was emotional and relational unity. You know why they gathered so often together? Because they needed each other. I mean, they were going through it. Not like your life. Your life is easy and good. I mean, they were getting persecuted going through hard times, stress, kind of trying to figure out how to live for God in a world that was not living for God. Are you, are you picking up my sarcasm at all here, you guys? Do you want to know the, a fundamental difference of first century Christians and us today? First century Christians desperately needed each other, and they knew it. Today, we desperately need each other, and we forgot it. And, and, and we're choosing this. We're choosing isolation. And not only are we choosing it, we're valuing it like we want to. We put a value on being alone. Can I work from home? I would love to work from home. I don't want to do Can I just not deal with people? If I could just not deal with people. How about a flexible schedule? Can, you get a, can I get on a flex schedule here? I want limited accountability. We're choosing this. Shopping online. Working online. Going to church online. Order your food online like people are intentionally pursuing a life that is destroying their mental health and robbing them of all real joy and lasting fulfillment let me say it again we've built a life around us that you were not made for you were made for this the culture around you that has constructed the reality of our civilization you got to learn child of god to be in the world but not of the world if you want to live this life that God pictures for you, the anxious for nothing life, the peace of God life that transcends all understanding, you can't go with the flow of culture. You got to find a different rhythm. You got to find a different pattern. God never intended it to be this way. At Discovery, our solution for isolation is something we call small groups. That's our solution. That's, that's how we do life together, how we share 
celebrate, cry, support. How we, this is how we do it. It's why we only do a Sunday service and we don't do a midweek gathering or anything like that because we want you connected with godly friends. Get around some other women of God and men of God. I, I, we just, I just like researched this before coming up here. In, in the last 30 days, like there has been 1,087 people to attend a small group at Discovery. That's 51% of our, of our average attendance to come to, of, of the adults at least. Um, which is great, but that means there's a lot of us still that are choosing isolation. We're not choosing connection. So I want to help you kind of understand why, like, why a group and choosing connection would be, would be good. And what you are choosing is not good, okay? So, so what does a Jesus-honoring small group look like? Let me just answer that for you, because I would love for you to choose connection. But let me give you, like, for those of you that have never tried it, what does this look like? What does it look like to be in a small group, in a Jesus-honoring small group? There are three things that you're going to find in these gatherings. Number one is this. It's a gathering of love. Some of you are like, that's a little too touchy for real. What do you mean love? You can gather in love, man. What are you talking about? Let me tell you, there's, this, is, this is the foundation, the core of an anxious for nothing life. It's the single premise that you are fully seen, you are fully heard, you are fully known, and they love you anyway. And you know them fully and completely, and you love them too. This means someone or a group of people knows everything about you. Even the, the, the darkest thoughts, the worst things you've done, the horrible madness that has happened to you, and they show up anyway in your life. To be fully known and fully loved, this is the foundation for an anxious for nothing life. If, if you want to be anxious for nothing, you cannot have it without this. Jesus says this, God says this, perfect love casts out fear. You, you got to have this foundation of, of love. John 13, Jesus said it like this in verse 34 or 35. A new command I give to you, love one another. As I have loved you, this is now your standard that you're to love others. This is, as I have loved you, that's the standard now that you are to love one another. John would go on to say in another one of his letters, he gave us the definition of love. God is love. God is love. And so when you are choosing this, when you choose connection and a gathering of love, you can choose loving people, here's what's happening. When you choose to love others, you're choosing to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. If you are not making this choice, if you are not loving one another, listen to me clearly, you are not walking in the Holy Spirit. It's not good. God's looking, and you think you're good because you and him are good, but it's not as good as you think this is. John chapter 1, in the beginning of this letter, he wrote this about Jesus. He said, the word became flesh and made its dwelling among us. And we've seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. Follow this with me, you guys. God is love and Jesus came full of grace and truth. Love then, listen. Grace and truth are the manifestations and fullness of love. What does it mean to, to be in a gathering of love? It means you are in a place of grace and a place of truth. It's a place of grace, and you need a place of grace, child of God. You need a place where you can talk about your marriage trouble. You can talk about what happened last week. Talk about your addiction, and people don't scoff at you and go, ugh. But they actually go, you know what? I feel you. Here's my dark side. This is, this is, uh, this is really what's going on in my life. You need that. You need a place where you're loved no matter what. You need a place of grace. But not only just a place of grace, you need a place of truth. People that are, they choose isolation for long enough, you ever notice this? They can be really weird. People in isolation get weird and you get dumb. You get dumb because it's just you and you got no one to tell you the truth. You need some people to tell you the truth. It's just, you know how many jobs that I've kept because I told somebody I wanted to go into my boss's office and chew them out or something and tell them off. And, and it's, I had someone in my life to go, mm -mm, that's, not, that's not smart. Don't do that. Hey, don't. That's not, okay, but leave me alone to my own devices and my isolation with my own thoughts long enough. Yeah, I got fired from that job. Yeah. Yeah. I shouldn't have said that. What was I thinking? You don't got no one in your life. Telling you the truth, you need a place of love, a gathering of grace and truth. And not only that, here's another one. These, these Jesus-honoring small groups, they're a gathering of healing. 
you come into this gathering of love and there is a place of healing where somehow God meets your needs and heals you through other people. This is what James chapter 5, 16 is talking about. Therefore, he says, confess your sins to each other. You might be more comfortable confessing them to God. You might know 1 John 1, 9, right? If you confess your sins to God, he is faithful and just and will forgive you sins and will cleanse you of all unrighteousness. But here, James is giving us the other side of this token. He's like, no, no, no. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous person is powerful and effective. I don't know if you've ever, ever noticed, you can confess all day to God and still not get healed. There's a lot of people who are always sorry about their issues, confessing them over and over and over again, but they haven't found healing, and this is why, right here. They don't got no one to hold them accountable. They don't got no one to open up to and share what's going on. They got no one to pray for them. You need somebody in your life you can go to and just say, man, I blew it. I blew it. And they go, man, that sucks. How are you not going to blow it again? You go, well, if I'm not going to blow it again, I'm going to need some help on this one because I like blowing it in that area. And the prayer of the righteous person, he says, is powerful and effective. You know, I can't pray powerfully and effective for you if I don't know really what's going on. Like, if I don't know what the issue is, I'll be praying for people at the altar, and I'll, I'll ask the question, how can I pray for you? And sometimes I get the answer, whatever the Lord shows you. I'm like, no, 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 that's not how this works. Hey, open your eyes. All right. Bro, what you? No, 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 you got to tell me. You don't, you don't, you, that's, you know what you're coming up for. You don't go, you don't do the doctor's office that way. You don't go to the doctor's office and they go, what are you here for? And you're all, whatever the Lord shows you. <laughs> no, you know why you made that appointment. You will, you will strip down in front of a doctor and be like, I've never seen this in front of my life. Doctor, what is it? You confess to God for forgiveness, but you confess to others for healing. This is, this is what a group is. This is what a group provides. When you choose connection, when you choose community and get out of that cave, you come into community, it's, it's, it's a gathering of love where you receive grace and truth. It's a gathering of healing. And, and the third thing, last thing, is it's a gathering of mission. It, it's, it's a people who are called together on mission for God. Let's go back to that Acts chapter 2 verse and kind of finish that there was more to it. Let me show it to you. Because in Acts chapter 2, 46, it says, Every day they continued to meet together in temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and glad and sincere hearts. Verse 47 says, Praising God and enjoying all the favor of all the people. And then the scripture says this, And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. This wasn't just this little small group that was like us four and no more. Now we're good. Close the group. We don't need anybody else in it. No. They were so in love with Jesus. And they were so... Intimate, they were so like loving one of each other authentically that it was so attractive to the others that every day people were coming, like, I don't need to be a part of this. How do I be a part of this every day? Our relationships are missional. Jesus said, This is how they know you're my disciple for your love for one another. In fact, when you look at the New Testament, there are 59 times that that we are commanded to do something one another that you cannot, if you're choosing isolation. You're choosing your cave. You cannot fulfill the scriptures, these 59 one another's in the New Testament. 59 times. In fact, let's read them all together. No, I'm just kidding. Let's read five of them. I'll give you five because I'm running out of time. Five one another's, okay? The first is this. The Bible tells us to serve one another in Galatians. Serve one another. Jesus said the greatest are those who serve not the ones who are being served. Some of you, listen, you're choosing isolation. You're, you let your loneliness and your aloneness turn to isolation because you're like, who am I going to connect with? I don't know who to connect with. But you are, so, you are way too mature, especially in the things of God, for you to be isolated in that cave waiting for someone else. Some of you need to get out of that cave and start your own group. You need to get some people into it. You should be the one actually connecting with others, not sitting on the side like going, where's the friend for me? You need to be out there loving people. <laughs> Serve one another. Serve one another. Here's the second thing. He says, show hospitality to one another. When was the last time you had someone in your home who wasn't there to fix your leaky faucet? Like someone in your home just to encourage each other and pray for each other and edify each other. When was the last time you gathered for that? The Bible says, be kind to one another in Ephesians 4, 32. In a world full of so much hate 
They'll counsel you. Man, I need some kindness in my life. Please be kind. Church, be kind to one another. Encourage one another, 1 Thessalonians says. There's people on your road right now. They need some encouragement today. They've been discouraged and beat up. Man, they're going through it, and they need a word of encouragement, man. Here's, here's this last one. Carry one another's burdens, the Bible says. Like, I wasn't, I can't carry this alone. I wasn't made to carry alone. I wasn't designed to carry this by myself, and neither were you. And, and you know this. Look, your body knows this. Your brain knows this. Your spirit knows this. Some of y'all know there's better. There's more. And you got to you got to take a risk and step out in faith and get out of your own world and love somebody the way God loved you. Some of you came in today and you're alone. You're looking around and it's like, where'd they go? I got no one on my right. Does, it, does anyone even care? And you got to be careful. Because when you're alone, there are some choices you got to make. How do you respond to this season? How are you going to respond to your aloneness? Are you going to let it turn into isolation? Or are you going to cry out to God? Praise Him. What's my purpose? What do you have for me? I promise you, God will bring you the right people. Hey, thank you for watching the Discovery Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join the Discovery Online family every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream event and share it with a friend. You can also support the ministry by clicking the Give button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thank you again for watching. Go love God, love each other, and change the world.